Today is October 29th, 2011. We are in San Francisco, California for the induction ceremony, 2011 induction ceremony of the Social Work Hall of Distinction. Uh, I'm Celeste Jones. I'm the professor and director of the School of Social Work and I'm here to introduce to you uh, Professor Jan O'Donnell who is uh, an inductee. And how did you become involved with the field of social work? Well, it probably leads back to my family. Um, both of my parents um, have been really involved in some kind of volunteer work. Um, there were four kids in our family, and so my parents always had different groups of kids at the house. There was a 4-H group that met every week or the, there was a church group that met every week. We didn't have many things for kids to do, and so my parents provided this for years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually they start, started taking in foster kids. Mm -hmm. So our family expanded. We had one at a time, fortunately, so that whoever we had got lots of attention. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really an important part of my beginnings of thinking about social work. And it wasn't exactly articulated then, but it, it sort of sowed the seeds. <clears throat> also, my grandmother, my mother's mother, was a very strong lady uh, who worked in a factory, a large factory, and she organized a union um, in the 40s and 50s uh, because there were no safety measures. People were getting their hands, fingers cut off, all kinds of injuries. And I can remember my grandmother sitting at her kitchen table with all of these union people who were helping her to organize, slamming their fist on the table about what needed to be done. Um, so that left a really strong impression on me. And she, she got the job done. So she was a pretty awesome lady. Yeah. yeah. She was really good to us, all of her grandkids, too. She loved kids. <laughs> Tough on the bosses, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another influence was a high school teacher that I had, a Mr. Smith, um, who came from the city to this little country town. There were 22 in my graduating class. And he was determined that he was going to expose us to the world. So we got to take a, a class trip to Chicago, and we got to go to the areas where there were homeless people, and we saw people living in cardboard boxes, refrigerator boxes. Mm -hmm. And then we went to a soup kitchen where they were serving meals to these people. And then after we got back, then he invited a woman who had an MSW, which was unheard of in this area, came and talked to the class. And that really um, planted a seed when she came. I can still picture her, Mrs. Prokos. Wow. <laughs> she was great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think those were probably the most important influences. Mm, incredibly inspiring. <laughs> yeah. So what in the field of social work and the political and social and economic climate like, um, what was the, all of that like when you first started in the field of social work? Well, I went to school at Michigan State University during the 60s. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of young professors who were very involved in um, the various movements that were going on at that time, uh, p particularly my political science. <laughs> wow. instructor who was the head of the Michigan uh, Students for Democratic Society. He was very inspiring. And we all had to do a community project. This was an undergraduate. Yeah. Um, then Kennedy was killed uh, at that time and Lyndon Johnson came in as president and um, he started ramping up the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of money poured into various agencies, started new agencies, um, providing opportunities, jobs, neighborhood centers. It was such an exciting time to begin social work. There was a lot of hope. Um, 
the civil rights movement. And so no matter where we went, that was part of it. Um, so it was so inspiring. Someone wrote a book called The Greening of America around that time, and that really inspired a lot of us that things were going to get better. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that happened that I think was important was the Vietnam War escalated enormously. Uh, LBJ, I love you, but not for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was either guns or butter. We couldn't afford to fund this horrendous war and continue to fund the war in poverty. Mm -hmm. So eventually we saw a lot of the programs that were started during that time began to uh, unfold. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we see the results of a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How have, how have things changed during your course in the field? Well, um, when I started in social work, this was in 1969 I graduated. One of the big movements at that time was to deinstitutionalize all of the developmentally disabled mm -hmm. and the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So my first job was to um, place people from the institutions into family care homes. Most of them went into small family homes. Some went into uh, larger facilities because of safety reasons. So um, that was quite exciting because I had done a, my first field placement in an institution as a graduate student uh, in a state hospital or a county hospital, Wayne County General Hospital in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm. And the other student from Michigan State and I uh, had to sleep on the ward with all of these women who had been institutionalized for like 40 years. It was like the snake pit, you know, people moaning and crying and hallucinating and oh. it was just horrible. <laughs> My roommate, uh, every, we, we were there for two days and every night after a day working in, on the ward or in the clinic, mm -hmm. she would get the hives and she would have to take a warm bath and oatmeal mm -hmm. because she had the hives were so bad so you can oh so you can understand most of that place was enough to give anybody the hives mm -hmm. uh, it was really disappointing to lose her because she was a very dear friend mm -hmm. of course they placed her in a different placement she did fine mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we've come a long way in terms of treatment of people who we used to put away in these back wards, um, except that now we have the problem of homelessness because we can't make them take their meds, we can't make them live in a home. So when I started, they didn't have any rights. Mm -hmm. If you said they had to go into a family care home or a facility, yeah. that's where they went. Wow. So it's been a, a big, big shift. Mm -hmm. So um, the funding is inadequate, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Continues to be a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And getting worse right now with the economic situation. Yeah. yeah. So how and when did you see the need for an MSW program in Northern California? Um, that need was always there. Um, when Archie McDonald started the, um, the BSW program at Chico State, he, the welfare directors helped him to start it. He was a, a former welfare director in Washington State. Mm -hmm. And uh, for one of our accreditation studies, I went back into the documents at the library just to see how all of this started and the understanding with those welfare directors and the university was that after a few years they would start an MSW program. Oh. So this was start this was planted from the beginning, but as you know, people move on and change. Memories are short in institutions except for those of us who stay a long time. 
<laughs> so that was planned. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that, but because the economic situation was so um, up and down, we had times where they were laying faculty off mm -hmm. and then the economy would get better and hire a bunch of people, lay them off. So the, the times economically were never right. And then we had a dean um, throughout all this time who was very, he was a stabilizing influence on the university. So he was very good, but he didn't really want any new programs. He was stable, but not a, a builder. Mm -hmm. So anyway, things kind of came together um, late in the 90s. He retired. We got a new dean. We got a new provost. Um, and then uh, Jim Kelly from Long Beach State, mm -hmm. former director, and uh, his colleague, uh, Gary Bess, mm -hmm. who still is involved with our program by doing some teaching, came to Cal up to Chico and convinced the university to allow them to offer a distance MSW program. And they brought their child welfare money with them. Mm -hmm. Well, this really perked up the um, administration at Chico State. Mm -hmm. What if they could get this money? Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but our, our dean at that time, Jim Jacobs, came from an institution where some of his best friends were in the MSW program. Mm -hmm. um, so he was very much in favor of it. Um, so, and we had a provost who had a, uh, I think his son uh, was going into an MSW program. So we had both some personal, political, and economic support. Mm -hmm. um, and Jim Kelly made an enormous impression at our institution. They affectionately called him the Johnny Appleseed of social work because he would help campuses start their own program. Mm -hmm. So he, um, I am greatly indebted to Jim Kelly and Gary Bess for helping us to do that. Um, Planning that Yeah, soon. And Jan Lee Wong um, from NASW was very helpful. In fact, He's a real hero of mine um, because he's such a master at working behind the scenes as well as being such an articulate public person. Um, but he did many things for us that helped this program. Uh, he's really a, a wonderful person. You mentioned uh. some things, but what were, what were some of the challenges um, that you faced during this, uh, not only uh, creating but developing the, the MSW program? The biggest challenge was our own institution. Mm -hmm. um, and it still is at times um, because institutions have a way of developing inertia and then when you have a new program being started, there's fear that their resources are going to be shortchanged and go to this other program. Um, and that continues. And so as long as you have educational institutions where the taxpayers, legislators, starve them to death, um, you're going to have this kind of competition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that was a challenge. Um, Another challenge was finding faculty to come to Chico because this was at a time where programs were expanding and not enough people were going in to, to get their doctorates. So we really were lucky to find good people mm -hmm. who stayed. You were one of our very first. <laughs> <laughs> I've never yeah. regretted it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I am so grateful. So grateful. What are so. some of the benefits gained? Okay. Did you? Mm -hmm. uh, no, go ahead and start the question again. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the benefits that were gained with this MSW program? 
Um, as the feasibility study that we had to do at that time pointed out, there was a tremendous shortage of child welfare workers, mental health workers, workers to work with an aging population, unemployed people, disabled people, because those problems are always magnified in a rural area because of lack of resources. Mm -hmm. So the MSW program really professionalized social work in all agencies. Um, so we, our clients, the citizens in our region are getting better served. Um, in child welfare, for instance, we have uh, people who can make better assessments about whether or not there is the severity of neglect or abuse mm -hmm. to uh, warrant whether you really should be removing kids or not or develop alternative plans. Mm -hmm. And also because of the particular program we have, we've really focused on collaboration, really trying to help agencies not use the silo method where everybody's separate but to try and help mental health and child welfare work together and I th and as you can see over time since we've graduated what nine groups mm -hmm. you can see that there is progress in this area because you get um, a critical mass of professional social workers out there and a lot of them go into administration so it begins to change how people in agencies see clients, mm -hmm. see the public. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's very exciting. What challenges did, um, or excuse me, what strategies did you use um, and that you were involved with to accomplish some of the goals that you had? Okay. I think the, the biggest strategy, well, one of the important things is, an, is that I always have carried with me from my master's program, and we had uh, a textbook, The Casework Relationship by Father Bistick, and I don't think anybody knows this anymore, but it was the seven principles of the casework relationship. Mm -hmm. But if you took all of those, no matter whether you worked with groups, individuals, families, or communities, they all fit. And the one that always struck me was um, um, begin where the client is. So when you're working with the welfare directors, what is it that they want being able to try and listen and hear? Because we all have ideas about what our program should look like or what it should be, but they're going to be hiring our workers. What do they see? They work with the clients. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a particular strategy. Mm -hmm. um, another was that none of this had been possible without teamwork. Absolute teamwork, always. Fortunately, I had worked in agencies where we had teams. The regional centers used teams. Um, in my first job, we had teams, mental health teams. So when we built the, the uh, MSW program, the faculty really, as we built, provided a lot of teamwork. Part of the teamwork, I think, leads into this next question, but, but how did you develop those partnerships and invite faculty to be involved in that with, with the regional agencies as, and the School of Social Work? How did you? Okay, that's a good question because it started long before the MSW. Mm -hmm. um, our field director, Mark Jeralaman, bless his heart, ever grateful to Mark, mm -hmm. and then later Pam Brown, who mm -hmm. took it over. M Mark Jeralaman had wonderful relationships with all of the agencies. Mm -hmm. We cover the state of Ohio, basically, mm -hmm. and so he had connections all over. If, um, probably about 15 years ago, they threatened to end the BSW program. And so Mark was kind of my partner, and he says, Jan, you take care of the university side. You let me take care of the community. About a week later, I got a call from the dean <laughs> who said, Jan, see that stack of letters? 
on my desk, he said. Call the dogs off. He says, we aren't going to cut your program. You've got your program. Mm -hmm. And it's that team. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has a part. So Mark Geralaman and his field liaisons over all those years provided that community connection because they thought so much of the program and the students. Uh, so that was a really important part of uh, teamwork. We, we always had advisory boards mm -hmm. for the program and then a field advisory board. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of the team, now I see that, uh, you know, Pam Brown started the idea of having training, regular training uh, for all of the field uh, liaisons and, and uh, field instructors together. And it became really quite exciting. I used to sit in on some of them. And they always got input from their team as to what the training needs were rather than the other way around. And it also sounds as though you took that feedback very seriously and brought back to the faculty. Mm -hmm. Truly representing the, the agencies. Mm -hmm. I think that was important. And sometimes the faculty didn't like to hear what the agencies um, had to say mm -hmm. because we all come out of our own experience and we think we know how things should be. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's the community is a partner. And I think the university um, administration really respects the relationship that social work has with the community. And they see that as a real strength for the university. What did you learn from these experiences that were either useful to you later or that might guide others with similar objectives and goals? Um, I think the importance of having your team members having worked in the field is important, very important. I know you had many years of practice even before you, you went on to get your doctorate mm -hmm. and you still continue to practice and provide service to the community. So I think that that's something that um, no matter what kind of program you're trying to start, it is important to have some experience. Um, and you too, you continue to practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, um, I worked in mental health and developmental disabilities for five years before I started teaching and then um, did some child welfare work um, every week to work with families, a lot of work with molested kids, worked with Parents United, the, the perpetrators, the families with the perpetrator. My husband and I used to do the do parenting with them and so it was it was good work but once the MSW program took over my life <laughs> my practice ended yeah. <laughs> couldn't do it all mm -hmm. yeah not fair to clients either sure yeah <clears throat> and I think another important thing is to take a long-term view um, Another important influence in my life was Wilbur Cohen, <laughs> who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Um, when I was in grad school and in my first job, my uh, agency boss sent me to Chicago to the National Conference on Social Welfare. And Wilbur Cohen, who we had studied at grad school, was the, one of the main speakers. And the thrust of the conference was to get unemployment below 4.7 percent. Can you imagine? Everybody was in up in arms. Then we asked Wilbur, how can, how can we get this to change? And he says, well, you have to understand that in the United States, to get any major policy changed, any major change, it takes about 20 years from the time you start. Oh. And that just, wow, no wonder it's, so you have to have a long-term view I don't know if that's true anymore, mm -hmm. but it held me in good stead in just waiting out for the right time to get this MSW started. Mm -hmm. A lot of patience. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not.
so what, what is your view about issues that we should be addressing today um, and what should we be doing? Um, I think that s students are really going to have to be prepared to work in social work that's going to be really changing. Um, our world is changing in ways that are scary. Um, we see the, the gap between the haves and the have not really dividing. Um, we have technology that's affecting practice, for better, for worse. I hope we never lose our people skills and do everything by email. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think students are really going to need to be taught really good um, problem solving skills and being able to change because that is going to be uh, like an escalating principle I think. Mm -hmm. um, another important issue is the importance of community involvement. Um, it would be easy to get stagnant and just say, oh, it's such a bother. But then if you do that, you lose the viability of your program because it's not connected mm -hmm. to the community. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more work. And I think that the, some of the programs that we have are going to need to be protected. And it will have to be a political protection, uh, the 4E program, mm -hmm. mental health programs. I don't know about aging. Um, to order, in order to keep them going and surviving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, social workers are going to have to become more comfortable with being political. Mm -hmm. I mean their skills we sort of learn intellectually mm -hmm. in grad school but to practice them it's really going to be important or we will lose it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And lifelong learning, I think, for our students. Uh, programs should provide opportunities for lifelong learning. That's critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is, it seems to be a theme for you is that, is that what you do always gives back to the community, whether it's, it's with higher education or these trainings for the mm -hmm. field instructors. Mm -hmm. um, seems really a, a strong component in your belief. Yeah, it is. It is. And I, and I think that comes from my upbringing. Mm -hmm. it, I never thought of it that way, but it, but it is. Yeah, and never mm -hmm. losing sight of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's so important about that? Is it the upbringing that... Yeah, I saw my parents do that. My father still does that. Um, he, he's 89 years old, and mm -hmm. I don't know about his driving skills, but he still takes people for their cancer treatments, and mm -hmm. he, he says, you've got to go see the shut-ins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and both of my sisters are in the helping professions. Uh, my sister is a geriatric nurse, and my other sister uh, was, is a uh, geriatric nurse's aide. And my brother, when he retired, he was a, a, a policeman. He now works with youth who, are, who have escaped probation. They've done something that's going to lead mm -hmm. somewhere else. So he's out there three days a week with these crews of kids, and he takes them to various places to build a church, mm -hmm. fix an older woman's home. Mm -hmm. So that's what he's doing. So very much a part of your yeah. upbringing. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So that's one of the reasons I was so shocked when um, I heard that I got this award was that's just what you do. And, and I mean I just was just absolutely blown away. <laughs> Still am. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's, there's a lot of recognition in what you, what you do and even how you do it is, is about empowering others. Um, and that's such a, a, a critical element in this loop of, of helping and doing uh, and creating community. Thank you. 
if you had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Um, I don't think that the MSW process would have been much different mm -hmm. because the time had to be right. Mm -hmm. all, it was like the stars all lined up. Yeah. <laughs> and everything worked. Mm -hmm. But one thing I would do is I would delegate more. Mm. And I have watched you do that. I have learned from you, and I didn't know that I didn't delegate enough until I retired and you took over and I decided I'm not going to, I took the advice from Al Siegel, one of our site visitors who said, if you retire, like he did, stay away, let them fly on their own. And you did, and you've built new programs, you've delegated. Oh, I just say, why didn't I do that? I wouldn't have been so tired all the time. <laughs> but it's, it's been very instructive to watch you. You're doing a beautiful job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank just you, a beautiful Jane. job. Mm -hmm. And I just know that this program that we both got going is going to keep flourishing. It, yeah. Well, it's, it's also very, you know, in looking at your leadership, it was uh, tremendous to see how you've weathered the, the, the growth of faculty, the shrinking of faculty. When I joined, it was mm -hmm. three. When you retired, it was 12. Yeah. And, and, and learning how to lead differently with the amount of people you had. Um, mm -hmm. What was was such a, a, a wonderful thing for me to see um, and see how you did that. Mm -hmm. So delegating more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I, I, and I I think people who really have a strong drive to create something need to let go and trust that others are going to do some of that work. You know, you build a team and have that trust. So I, th I would say that's a really important message that I would like to leave. Mm. <laughs> so that would be what you would want to, a message you would give people entering or currently mm -hmm. working in, in uh, social work education. Mm -hmm. What about what might lessons learned that you would want to give our graduates, those who are working in the field? <laughs> We get awfully, it's so seductive to focus on the relationship with the individual and family. To, to really be successful, you really need to get comfortable in the political arena mm -hmm. and in the community. You just try it. Just try it a little bit. Go with someone else. Mm -hmm. And it gets easier and easier the more you do it. But it's really important. Critical. Critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same skills that you have in people building mm -hmm. skills with individuals and families, you do that with your directors, the parent groups or whatever group, you know, if you're genuine, those mm -hmm. are the same skills. Being respectful. That's great advice. Are there any other comments you'd like to share in closing? Well, I'd like to thank um, the members uh, of the um, Hall of Distinction for nominating me uh, or for choosing me. I'm very grateful. I hope I meet some of them tonight. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in the nomination uh, process. Um, there were a lot of really wonderful pieces in there that you put together that were just beautiful. My, I took this back to show my father and he literally cried when he read this thing. Wow. Yeah, it was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd like to thank everyone and I'm glad that you have this process so that we can keep some of these memories mm -hmm. uh, and lessons for posterity. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're very humble with your accomplishments, but your journey has been quite unique and has really um, changed the face of how we do social work in Northern California. Really Thank has. you. 
and I look forward to watching that unfold for years <laughs> to come. <laughs>